All right, so now let's do part two of our sugar derivatives. And so we're still talking about the formation of glycoproteins. We'll talk about glycolipids and um, our red blood cells, for example. But let's go back and revisit our glycoproteins. And so glycoproteins are just simply a protein. And proteins obviously are made by our cells. And in proteins, you're going to have asparagine residues and attached to those asparagine residues can be carbohydrates. In this case, they're showing branch chain, which is very um, common. Um, our O-linked glycoproteins are gonna be attached to serine or threonine, and our N-linked glycoproteins are gonna be attached to asparagine. So most proteins in the blood are gonna be these glycoproteins, proteins with sugars attached. Um, such proteins are hormones, antibodies, our blood clotting enzymes, extracellular matrix proteins. Um, other proteins that are glycosylated are gonna be incorporated onto the cell surface and serve as receptors. So here we just have a few different fates of our glycosylated proteins. Our mannose phosphate receptor is important for targeting um, key enzymes to our lysosomal compartment. You also have secreted proteins that are gonna be um, have carbohydrates glycosylation and they're gonna be secreted. You also have membrane bound proteins that are gonna be incorporated into the membrane with their carbohydrate moieties interacting with the water aqueous environment. And so these are just some of the ways that proteins can be um, either released or, or trafficked traffic to other areas. So when we talk about the addition of carbohydrates, um, there's gonna be two different major ways that this is done. One is gonna be through N-linked, and one is gonna be through O-linked. So for our N-linked glycosylation, this is going to happen in the ER lumen, and it's going to involve a molecule called dolycophosphate. Dolycophosphate, it has isoprene units, and it has a phosphate group shown here that's going to build our sugar moiety. And so this is not a protein, Oh, dolycophosphate, it's, it's sort of a, um, a building block for our sugars. And then dolycophosphate is going to transfer the sugars to the asparagine residues in the lumen of the ER. So just to reiterate, we have our N-linked carbohydrates, which is going to require dolycophosphate. And this is going to attach the sugars to asparagine residues. We also have O-link carbohydrates. And these are going to be added to OH groups of serine and threonine side chains. Now sugars are going to be removed and added as your glycoprotein gets moved from the ref ER through the Golgi complex. So modification of these sugars can occur um, throughout the process of your um, protein being uh, made and packaged. Now glycosylation is basically where you have the oligosaccharide um, core starts in your um, cytosol. So for example, you have here your dolycophosphate. It's going to be embedded into the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. You then have your UDP um, and acetylglucosamine um, that is going to be added. So you have your dolycophosphate with the two N-acetylglucosamine residues. And then you have some mannose residues shown here that get added to the N-acetylglucosamine residues on your dolycophosphate. At some point, this is all going to be translocated um, into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum shown here. And then you're going to continue to build on that sugar moiety. So in the ER lumen, the first step is going to be the construction of the moiety. So you're going to continue building on the molecule that was being built on in the cytosol. So step four is the first step of the lumen. And you, again, continue to add mannose, um, glucose units, and they just keep building. And the dolycophosphate is going to um, facilitate the addition of these additional sugars. Now, as you have the core oligosaccharide, which is this core sugar being built, it gets transferred from dolycophosphate to an asparagine residue of a protein. So while all of this is being built over here, 
you have your protein being built on your ribosomes using your messenger RNA. And as the protein is being built on the ribosomes, it is being um, it is translocating to the lumen of the ER, and where there is an asparagine um, residue, the glycophosphate can transfer the oligosaccharide that it's been building to that asparagine residue. And so you see the asparagine residue has this sugar moiety now attached to that. Um, the dolico pyrophosphate then gets translocated back to the um, cytosol of the ER and a single phosphate gets removed to regenerate dolycophosphate. And then dolycophosphate can pick up more sugars. Now, O-link glycosylation is a little bit different. So you're gonna have attachment of carbohydrate sugar chains to the OH groups of serine, threonine, or hydroxylysine, as in the case of collagen specifically. And this is, does not require dolycophosphate. It's simply that the sugars get added to the proteins at these sites one at a time, and it's gonna be a stepwise addition of the sugars. Now, O-link glycosylation is gonna be important for different um, glycoproteins, and so some of them are listed here. We have um, N-acetylglucosamine that can be O-linked. Um, you have mucin um, O-linkages, which is gonna be very important in creating mucus at our um, uh, mucosal tissues um, for your lungs, your gut, um, genital urinary tract, places like that. We also have O-linked um, nanosylation with NANA. Fucose can be added with NANA for important molecules, alpha dextroglycan, for example, for mannose. Um, epidermal growth factor domains for fucose with NANA. NANA, of course, is sialic acid. Um, uh, N-acetyl neuramic acid, or sialic acid. You can also have fucose without um, sialic acid um, or O-link glucose and O-link lactose. Um, there is also important for proteoglycans, so glycosaminoglycans. And this is for our proteoglycans. And just remember, proteoglycans are typically have more extensive glycosylation. Now, mucin glycoproteins are the most abundant of our O glycans. Um, they're going to form dense sugar coated proteins that are resistant to being broken down for proteolysis. They're important in those mucosal barriers, so they're going to be very abundant in mucus secretions. And all are going to have the um, N acetyl glucosamine. I'm sorry, N acetyl gla glactosamine. G A L is glactosamine. Um, and that sugar is going to be attached to the serine or threonine, just like all O glycans are going to be attached to serine or threonine, except for some collagen. Now, the importance of O linked is going to be in protein stability. Um, it also has a function with respect to the overall enzyme activity of the molecule, the, the protein. They can also provide some level of specificity in receptor mediated signaling. Um, the mucin O glycans are going to bind to water, and so they're going to form a gel um, solution that is going to be very protective. So it's going to help to keep your normal flora bacteria from actually interacting with your cells. They are actually suspended in um, these um, solution or gel, as an example. Um, o monosylation is the incorporation of mannose into proteins, and this is again going to be attached to serine or threonine residues because of the O. Um, these are found on alpha dextroglycan, um, other glycoproteins, many that are involved in neural tissue. The GDP activated mannose is going to, in this case, be transferred to um, dolycophosphate and is going to be synthesized similar to N leak glycoproteins. Alpha dextroglycan is one of the best studied O metosylated proteins, which is essential for dystrophin glycoprotein complex, which is in skeletal muscle cells. The defects with O metosylation can lead to reduced function, and this is called congenital muscular dystrophy. They have a very diverse range of um, symptoms, so it's not just one single disease. 
Uh, one very severe form is the walker Wahlberg syndrome, uh, in which people with this will die within the first year of life. And you also have the muscle eye brain disease, or MEB, which is less severe um, form of the congenital muscular dystrophy. Hexosamine um, biosynthesis is where you have modification, again, on serine and threonine residues of proteins. And this is going to be an unacetylglucosamine um, linkage. There are many proteins that get hexosamine um, modifications. They include transcription factors, proteins that are in both nuclear and cytoplasmic location, your cytoskeletal proteins, oncogenes, kinases, etc. Some specific examples are glucose 6-phosphatase, the AMP kinase, RNA polymerase 2, um, eukaryote initiation factor 5, and also about 600 other proteins. What's key about this, it's given the name hexosamine, but the synthesis of it starts with that um, anacetylglucosamine. So it all starts with glucose. So the hexosamine biosynthet biosynthesis pathway is, you can think of it because it starts with glucose, it is a glucose sensor. The formation of the N-acetylglucosamine attached to the, or activated by the UDP, is going to rely on glucose, um, glutamine, so amino acid uh, metabolism, ac acetyl-CoA, fatty acid metabolism, and nucleotide metabolism because of the incorporation of uridine. And so if we go through this really quickly, remember we have glucose, which starts everything, and this is gonna become glucose 6-phosphate. And then glucose 6-phosphate, of course, becomes fructose 6-phosphate. And this can go to glycolysis. And, but fructose 6-phosphate we just talked about is sort of the precursor for building your amino, um, amino sugars because glutamine can come in and donate that nitrogen, and then you get glucosamine 6-phosphate. And then keep in mind that glutamine is part of the amino acid metabolism. Okay, so now that you have glucosamine 6-phosphate, this starts the hexosamine biosynthet biosynthesis pathway. And so the next step will become your um, N-acetyl glucosamine, so you add an acetyl-CoA. And this, of course, is fatty acid metabolism. And then you become N-acetyl glucosamine 6-phosphate. And this will become N-acetyl glucosamine 1-phosphate. Um, and then once you have N-acetyl glucosamine 1-phosphate, you have the rate-limiting step of making your N-acetyl glucosamine uh, UDP and acetyl glucosamine. Um, so this is going to require UTP. So this is your nucleic acid metabolism. And then you're going to have the, um, the um, enzyme GFAT. And then GFAT is going to be glutamine, fructose, 6-phosphate, amidotransferase. And this is going to lead to UDP um, and acetylglucosamine, which I'm going to abbreviate now. Okay, and then the, so this is going to be, you have a protein uh, with an OH group, serine, for example. You add that, and then you get a glycosylated protein. Okay, and so you start building this. So the O-link glycosylation is important in glucose metabolism because many of the 
um, enzymes involved in insulin signaling, for example, are going to be um, uh, um, glycosylated through this hexosamine biosynthet biosynthesis pathway. So this is the hexosamine biosynthe biosynthesis pathway, this, this area right here. Now, this is thought to be important for um, insulin resistance in type 2 diabetics because, again, that rate-limiting step, which is going to be metabolized by glutamine fructose 6-phosphate imidotransferase. I'll spell this one out. Glutamine fructose. So the rate limiting step, um, so in some cases you'll get overexpression of your um, GFAT, which can lead to insulin resistance. Um, the proteins involved in insulin receptor signaling that have this um, O-linked N-acetylglucosamine are your insulin receptor substrate, that RS1. Um, you also have your... Um, PI3 kinase, phosphatidyl and inositol 3 kinase, protein kinase B, and your pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which are all going to require this um, um, glycosylation. And so it's also thought that proteins involved in translocation of those GLUT4 receptors in muscle and adipose tissue also have, um, begin with your um, as acetylglucosamine um, glycosylation. So the exact role of this in insulin resistance is not clear, um, but it's thought to have a role. And so there's also some um, linkage to cysteine methylation and histone modification that could have a role in this process as well. Now, another thing that's very important is targeting enzymes to your lysosomes. Now, your lysosomes are a very important organelle because they are what breaks down um, your, your cells, proteins, and your cell organelles if they are damaged. And so there are lysosomal storage diseases that occur in which your, your cells become laden with um, all of these um, proteins and um, lipids that need to be broken down, but the enzymes are not in the lysosomes because there's a defect in trafficking, and so they accumulate and your cells become dysfunctional. So lysosomes, you can think of them as your cell's digestive system, and they're there to maintain homeostasis of the actual cell. Um, so they are just going to help to recycle worn out organelles. Um, they're also important, of course, in protecting against foreign invasion by other um, agents such as bacteria and viruses. However, the enzymes have to go from the um, endoplasmic reticulum to the actual lysosome. So the targeting of lysosomal enzymes is going to occur in the Golgi. So we have O um, glycosylation because it's occurring in the Golgi. And you have N-acetylglucosamine 1-phosphate is going to be added to a carbon-6 of mannose residues that have been added to whatever the enzyme is. Um, the N-acetylglucosamine is going to activate it again by UDP and it's going to be be transferred to mannose by that N-acetylglucosamine phosphotransferase. Um, this is going to be specific for lysosomes. So N-acetylglucosamine um, is removed, leaving the mannose residues phosphorylated at position 6, so it's called the mannose 6-phosphate at this point. And then a mannose 6-phosphate receptor is on the membranes of Golgi, and this receptor targets the enzymes to the lysosomes. So it's a mannose 6-phosphate receptor binding to the phosphorylated mannose residues at position 6, and that is going to help this enzyme now get to the um, lysosome. Inclusion cell disease or eye cell disease is a rare disease, but this has to do with lysosomal enzymes that lack that mannose phosphate marker, and therefore they cannot be trafficked to the lysosome, and the enzymes needed to digest um, organelles or whatever they need to adjust are not present. So this is a deficiency in phosphotransferase. 
Um, the function of phosphotransferase, again, is to recognize the proteins by that um, three-dimensional structure, uh, the, the mannose residue, and target them to the lysosome. Um, in eye cell disease, lysosomal enzymes are instead secreted from the cell, and so you get accumulation of non-degraded molecules in lysosomes, and these form these inclusion bodies. Okay, so this is the one that's defective in the eye cell disease. Now we also have um, small interfering RNAs, and these are potential um, th treatments for cancer patients. Um, they are involved in post-transcriptional interference, and so they're called small interfering RNAs. Um, there is a problem of targeting these small interfering RNAs to the targeted cell, uh, so there are some companies that are trying to make these molecules um, targeted by adding different sugars to them so that when cells take them up, they get to the right location. So there are some companies that have tagged these small RNAs with um, N-acetylglactosamine, and this is going to allow hepatocytes to take up the small interfering RNAs through a receptor on their surface um, and so this is a under investigation as using sugars to address certain substrates to a targeted cell. So you're giving them sort of the, the key that lets them into the door of the cell. Um, so GPI linkages or glycosylphosphatidyl inositol anchored proteins, GPI, um, are going to be important for tethering um, glycoproteins to the outer leaflet of the membrane. Um, the GPI linkages are going to be at the C terminus of the glycoproteins and um, they are going to be relevant. All of our red blood cells surface glycoproteins, um, the DK accelerating factor, um, and these are important because they are going to help to protect your red blood cell uh, from things like complement. Acetylcholine esterase, um, our neural, neural cells also have adhesion molecule 120, uh, which is also going to be a GPI anchored protein. Now the glycoproteins that are anchored by GPI are glycidated proteins. Okay, so now let's shift a little bit and talk about our glycolipids. Now our glycolipids are a lipid that have sugars attached to them. And a role is to provide energy um, as well as a cell surface marker for recognizing different cell types. Glyco glycolipids are going to be a class of sphingolipids, and they're synthesized from our nucleotide sugars, uh, in which you're going to add the different monosaccharides to the hydroxymethyl group of a lipid ceramide. Um, there are, glycolipids can contain sialic acid. Um, and this is again produced from n acetyl um, They're going to be found often on the cell surface and they're going to have some specificity with respect to recognition, um, being able to have the cell uh, recognized. So for glycolipids, you have a ceramide um, backbone. So they're all going to be derived from sphingosin. This is going to include your cerebicides and your ganglicides um, that are in the Golgi apparatus. Ceramide is uh, basically a fatty acid plus uh, sphingosine, and um, your cerebrocytes are going to be synthesized from ceramide plus adding UDP glucose or UDP galactose. So your gangliosides are going to be produced from UDP sugars um, with Nana, for example. And so this is just an example of a um, ceramide with um, sugar attachments. You have a glucose, a galactose, you have an N-acetylglactosamine, and then you also have your sialic acid residue attached to this. Now your ceramide is just being shown here um, as an example of the structure. Now for your cerebrosides, um, these are, gla uh, are glycolipids that are important in the brain, brain tissue as well as medullary sheaths of nerves. And 
they get hydrolyzed and yield sphingosine, galactose, and other uh, sugars as well. Uh, sphingosine is a basic unsaturated amino alcohol. Um, neuramic acid are derivatives of silic acid, and the most predominant form is, of course, an acetylneuramic acid, which is important for adhesion as well as migration. So the importance of glycolipids are going to be for intracellular communication. They're also going to be recognition factors on the surface of cells. Our ABO antigens in the blood are glycolipids. So our ABO are a group of blood antigens. So what is an antigen? An antigen is a molecule that can produce an antibody response. Okay, that's all it is. Um, so our bodies are made up of antigens. If you take our blood and put it into a rabbit, a rabbit will see our antigens as foreign and make antibodies against them, for example. So with respect to the ABO blood group, um, antigens are the carbohydrate moieties of the glycolipids on the surface. So what that means is if you are A positive, you will see B blood antigens, the carbohydrate portion of them, as being different and you will make an immune response against the B antigens and attack blood cells that have the B antigens. Same thing if you're B positive, you'd have the same reaction to an A, um, a blood cell with only A on the surface. Um, so ABO on the surface of the red blood cells are going to be linked to sphingolipids and therefore they're called glycosphingolipids. The ABO antigens in serum are carbohydrates and they're associated with proteins in the form of glycoproteins. So one thing to keep in mind is some people have secreted ABO antigens, so those would be those in the serum. Not everybody secretes ABO antigens, they're only found on the surface of blood cells. Um, the property for secretion versus non-secretors can be used in forensics for cases such as rape, for example. So here are our glycolipids that are attached to our proteins. So our proteins are simply R. They're just shown here as R. And so you have um, a common um, structure for all three of our blood type. We have type O, which has an acetyl glucosamine with a galactose and a fructose. And that you can see is common throughout all of the different blood types. And so that's why your O type is going to be the universal donor because it's going to simply give uh, or donate blood that has the sugars that are similar to the recipient and the recipient doesn't, um, doesn't see the O type blood as being foreign. Type A blood is going to have an N-acetylglactosamine at the non-reducing end, shown here, and type B simply has a galactose type shown here. And that small difference is enough to enable rejection of type A blood in a person with type B and type B blood in a person with type A and rejection of both A and B in a type O. Now there are some defective glycoprotein degradation which occurs in um, lysosomes. To degrade glycoproteins, you, it requires glycosylases, which are a form of hydrolases. Um, you have the exoglycosylases that are going to be removed from the non-reducing ends. And these are going to be a variety of different ones that combine to different um, sugar substrates. You have endoglycosylases that are going to cleave from within, and they have broad specificity. So your exoglycosylases are going to be substrate specific whereas your endoglycosylases are going to have more broad specificity. Um, think of it kind of as alpha amylase. Alpha amylase was an endo, so it cleaved from the inside and it could cleave um, at various sizes of sugars, whereas your, your other disaccharidases had to work on specific structures, and it's kind of the same thing here. Um, so you can have some disorders that you have abnormal storage of glycoproteins, and it is caused by defects in the genes encoding these glycosylases. 
and these are lysosomal storage diseases. Um, enzymes that are going to remove sugars in lysosomes are the same for glycolipids and glycoproteins. So if you have an enzyme deficiency um, that has it, the ability to work on glycolipids and proteins, both proteins and lipids will accumulate inside of that lysosome. So some defects in degradation of our sphingolipids are shown here. We have our Tay-Sachs disease. Tay-Sachs disease is where you have a enzyme deficiency of hexose, hexose amidase 1, and you're going to have accumulation of uh, your lipids. We have Tay-Sachs variant or Sandoff disease, and that's hexose amidase 1, I mean, sorry, A and B. Um, and so that's going to have accumulation of your, your different lipids as well as your gangliosides. Um, you have Goucher disease, Neiman Prick disease, that's the one where they basically eat their fingers. Um, and so you have different enzymes, beta glucosidase or sphingomyelinase are going to be deficient, etc. Now I just want to briefly touch on lectins. Um, lectins have the ability to also recognize carbohydrates. Um, and so homostasis of cells is dependent on these lectins, which are proteins. These can bind to specific carbohydrate structures. Um, they contain a carbohydrate recognition domain. And the definition of lectins are called non-immunoglobulins that are capable of agglutinizing erythrocytes. So we have C-reactive proteins, we have selectins, and we have mannose binding proteins, all are types of lectins. And we'll talk more about those um, when we talk when we get to immunology. Okay, so just keep in mind that we have activated sugars. Um, so those are UDP, uh, glucose and galactose, for example. And those are going to be the precursors for many glycosyl transferase reactions. Lactose is going to be formed as needed by UDP galactose, which came from UDP glucose, and the addition of an additional glucose molecule. UDP glucose can become UDP glucuronate that is going to solubilize many different types of molecules, including bilirubin or different toxins, and it's going to make them available for secretion. Uh, we have O-link carbohydrates in which the carbs are added to proteins sequentially at serine and threonine residues. We have N-link carbohydrates in which you have a branch um, chain that is made by dolycophosphate, then gets transferred to the um, amide nitrogen of the asparagine molecule or amino acid of a protein. Glycolipids are a class of sphingolipids that are going to add carbohydrates to a ceramide backbone. Sialic acid is important in um, making your, especially your mucosal secretions, uh, or actually your cells just interacting with the aqueous environment. And it has a unique, um, uh, it has a unique way of being produced. It starts in the cytoplasm, and then it has to go to the nucleus to get activated. Um, if there are enzymes required to degrade glycoproteins or glycolipids, that are defective, this can lead to accumulation of these glycoproteins and glycolipids, and you can lead to things like eye cell disease um, or different um, storage diseases, lysosomal storage diseases. Uh, sphingolipidosis are a class of diseases that have problems degrading glycosphingolipids, and lectins are proteins that have the ability to bind different carbohydrate moieties, and our immune system uses them um, to bind to for example, foreign bacteria.